What they could have had a SWAT team, they could have had Bearcats, yeah. what and was helicopters. The that somebody had a gun and there was a shooting. There is no unity in Islam. I don't want to be the one who breaks this fear. You are saying that there are moral obligations that would apply to anyone, not, not just us. How does Islam not have a moral obligation to protect the innocent? Because they are the innocent. 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 Because they All right, now I'm definitely a vlogger. <laughs> um, hi. I figured I'd make some kind of videos along the trip to um, commemorate it. I don't know what I'm going to be able to do because it's going to be really busy this weekend. Um, last night, let's see, um, I got to Steel Valley Church, and when I came around the corner, it was like, well, I had been driving through what well, looked like kind of a rough area. I came around the corner and I was like, whoa! Because I'll show you a picture, but this church, it looks like it maybe it was a Catholic church or something at some point. It's this huge, old stone, beautiful building. And they hosted the stuff last night, so I got to mingle a little bit, and it was still super cool to be able to see all these people in person. Um, people that I've been following online and talk to sometimes in live streams and things like that but now I you know I get to see them in person and shake their hand and that kind of stuff and then um, Lewis Lionheart which is a great name by the way Lewis Lionheart and Hatun Tash talked about Dawa which is um, Islam's version of evangelism it means a call so Dawa is essentially referring to calling people to Allah and that devolved really quickly because Hatun is a very a uh, personable woman and wants to have conversations with everybody. So they started the, the presentation, but there's a Muslim in the audience and he spoke up and then she brought the mic to him and they were just having a conversation for like a half hour while everybody else was watching. To read the Bible and then not know what they believe because they are not Christians. And when it comes to Islam, you don't, there is no unity in Islam. I don't want to be the one who breaks this to you. If there was unity in Islam, Saudi Arabia wouldn't ban the, ban the Quran, which Moroccan and Algerian Muslims are reading. If there was unity in Islam, we wouldn't have Muslims who were beheading one another from early stages of Islam. Today, Muslim world is shaken by Shias, Sunnis, Ahmadis, Quranomis, all other heretic, heretic Sufis, whatever you put in that mind. And in Pakistan, Ahmadiyya Muslims are being murdered by their Muslim brothers. After that was Usama Dakdak, who's an Egyptian Christian. I don't know all that much about him. I think he has a ministry called Straightway Ministry. but. I didn't know anything about him going in, but I want to know everything about him coming out because he's amazing. His personality is wonderful, uh, very, very loud person, but not in a bad way. Just very, very funny, very naturally funny. He's like the uncle that you want to have around all the time, you know, <laughs> Uncle Usama. And he talked about, this is a, a really cool topic that I hadn't thought about, but lies about Jesus in modern American textbooks. Um, that they're teaching people in high school. So the textbooks were from 2004 and 2005 and stuff like that. So they're a little dated now, <clears throat> but I don't really think the information's changed since then. But there were examples of textbooks just calling Jesus, or they would say things like, according to the Christians, this is what they say about Jesus, or according to the Christians, this is what they say about his disciples or whatever. But they don't use those terms with Islam. And he said that the reason for that was if you say, instead of saying, this is what happened about Muhammad, instead you say, according to the, it, the Muslims, this is what happened about Muhammad, um, it kind of dismisses the authority of the text um, that you'd be pulling from, which would be the Quran in that case, uh, or the Hadith. So the Bible, um, if they say, according to the Bible or according to the Christians, not this is just what happened, it kind of dismisses that authority and makes it a step down. So there was a lot of cool examples of that, but then he kind of went into a general gospel presentation, and there were some non-Christians in the room, so I hope that that was helpful to them. Um, let's see, then they had a panel, and they asked us, 
would you rather have, because it was getting late at that point, they asked us, would you rather have a, a Q&A panel for an hour or just mingling? And I was kind of silently thinking mingling because that meant I could slip out and go to the hotel. But they said Q&A, so we stuck around for another hour and ten minutes or something. And it was good Q&A. I asked a question about um, um, a girl I know who is m trying to get married to a Muslim, and there's a, b a bunch of emotional baggage there. Um, so it's hard to talk to them about Islam. It was like 11.15 and maybe even later and it was time to go back to the hotel which was an hour and a, ha a half away so I got in I ended up getting in because I had to stop for gas I ended up getting in the hotel at, at 1.21 in the morning now I'm here waiting for Ernest to uh, get finished getting ready and we're gonna head to brunch in Cleveland, Ohio and then the rest of today, after that, there's some more presentations. And tomorrow, was a, it's a day full of presentations, but I got invited to do something kind of special. So after a, uh, there's a presentation by Vocab Malone at 11 on the Black Hebrew Israelites. After that, he's going to drive to Cleveland and spend a few hours there uh, talking to some. And so he invited me to go with him. So I think I'm going to go do that. So yeah, that's about it. I guess I'll see you later. We're outside First Cleveland Mosque in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, looking to hand out some stuff to the Muslims once they, once they come out of here, but it looks like somebody called the cops on us, so let's, let's see what's happening. Grilling them. Grilling them over there. Poor guys. Uh-oh. Just it in. Yeah. What are you Christians doing over here? Well, they have the responsibility to recover. So that's, that's not a bad thing. Well, well the, they, they didn't tell them to leave. That's the other. Yeah, thing that's what I was just going to say. The fact that they kept on walking means. Well, they did tell us to leave. <laughs> oh, that's that's the point. It's the joy yeah. of being in the, this country. Yeah. Yeah. Thank goodness we're not in North Africa. No, we'd be dead. We'd be dead already. Yep, you're right. Welcome to Cleveland. Land of the Muslims? It's our lives and in danger. You know, from you guys knew it's like, well imagine imagine like us and I'm like thinking, how are you how's your life in danger coming to a scene where there's no trouble? You know what I mean? I didn't say Okay, it, but... yeah, he's right though. Because here's where their life is in danger when that kind of situation happens. When when somebody makes a false accusation and somebody comes to solve it, they come with they come all pumped up ready to deal with it. Mm -hmm. They have to pump themselves up in order to deal with it. Right. All right. So you get somebody who could have a heart attack on the way. I mean, or could have an oh, yeah. accident on the way. So it's, it's, well, I was, I was, was concerned that? when he said it because what they, could have, they could have SWAT team, they could have Bearcats yeah. and what was helicopters. The that somebody had a gun there and there was a, a gun, shooting. A rifle? I mean, you said there was a fight too or something? Fight, yeah, yeah, that was the first thing he said, a fight, and then he mentioned a gun and a shooting. And, uh, and they said that... And I, I told him, thank you for the way that you guys came up on us with that in mind you right because they could have they could have come out guns drawn everybody hands you know yeah yeah, yeah yeah hands up yeah that was nice hands up get on the ground don't move oh the black cop is is a pastor yeah so he was like <laughs> he was i see he came and shook everybody's hand oh, so that's i was amazing. watching well i saw him hide, like shaking the muslim's hand and i was just like oh that's how the, the cops are treating the muslims they just made a false claim trying to get us killed yeah. like death by cop and then um but then, but then when he came over to us, he's like, "Hey, I'm with you guys," and he showed us his tattoos. He had crosses Dude. all over him, and um, <laughs> and then it turns out he's a pastor at a church right down the street. Awesome. And uh, and nobody got hurt. Wow! Imagine that. Yeah. That'll be a story for us to share. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's wild. Um, apparently, the Muslims called the cops on us and said that there was some kind of fight going on around here and that there was a gun drawn and even a shooting apparently i was standing on the other side of the street so i don't know but um yeah yeah none of that happened and actually one of the cops is a pastor and he had cross tattoos on his forearms and he's like hey i'm, I'm one of you guys so the cops rolled up and uh asked some questions and they're still talking over there but it seems like they're doing a good job shout out to cleveland police for uh being real smart. 
Well, it's pretty cool that I get to go to places like this. Uh, we got some amazing fields here. This is right outside Lodi Community Church, or Lodi, in Lodi, Ohio. And, uh, yeah, I'm here with all these people, and gonna learn some cool stuff. Cool stuff about Jesus, and Christianity, and Islam, and all kinds of stuff. So, looking forward to it. The new atheists. Anyway, she described ag agnostics as atheists without the guts to say it. <laughs> and then you get to the new atheists, and they define atheism in a way that's pretty similar to just agnosticism, right? And so she would... Sadly, she was killed by her people from her own foundation. Uh, murder... Well, some of you laughed. You said... <laughs> you said <laughs> monsters. Um, anyway, uh, she was murdered by people who, who worked for her. Um, but if she were around today and, and she saw atheists, it's just lack of belief, uh, I think she would be, well, you know, she'd be rolling, I'll say it, she would be rolling over in her grave right now if she saw what had happened to um, atheism. Uh, anyway, you, you, so atheism, of course, just means, you know, not theism. And so technically a person who doesn't believe in God or gods uh, qualifies as an atheist, even if that person happens to believe in ghosts and spirits and so on. If you don't believe in God, you would technically be an atheist. But uh, the, the, the strong version of atheism, which is what most atheists thought back in the day, and what most atheists in the West think, actually think today, is basically naturalism, right? The natural world is all that exists, and there's, there's nothing apart from from the natural world. So that if there's no God, no gods, no angels, no demons, no spirits, and so on. So I'll bring it back to uh, a more flexible version of atheism in the end, but we're gonna talk about naturalism, the, the, the strong version of, of atheism that is naturalism, just the natural world, the natural world is all that exists. We're gonna focus on that and then we'll bring it around um, later on. So focusing on the strong version of atheism, is that, uh, is that compatible with logic, science, and reality? So supernaturalism would be the view that something supernatural exists, um, and then you have various forms. If you're, if you're a theist, Christian, you are, you are a, a supernaturalist of one sort. Um, and supernaturalism would usually include the idea not just that there are supernatural entities, but also that they interact with the world somehow. So these are very different worldviews, and sometimes we want to show other people or convince other people that our worldview is the correct one. One problem that arose with the so-called new atheism is that the leaders of the movement started training people with a methodology not designed to get people to the truth. They trained them just to play skeptic, which is very, very easy to do. Playing skeptic is very easy. If you don't want to believe in something, almost, almost anything that anyone can bring up that you don't want to believe in, you could dial your skepticism level up enough so that nothing would ever qualify as evidence. And there are lots of examples of this. Uh, one that, that I like, just because it was nice to see someone being so honest, was uh, Richard Dawkins in a discussion with Peter Bogosian, when Dawkins was asked something along the lines of, if God did exist and he wanted to show you that he existed, what evidence could God give you that he existed? And Dawkins said that when he was younger, he would have said, well, if, you know, if I hear some booming voice saying Richard Dawkins believed in me or something like that, that would have done it. He says, but since then I've come to realize that if that happened, I would just say, I would just think I'm hallucinating. And so they go back and forth on what could actually even qualify as evidence in his mind. And they got to the point where they're saying, well, what if a message was written in the stars? Something like, Richard Dawkins, believe in me. <laughs> and they, they, they agreed that in order to believe that God did it, you'd have to rule out the idea that extremely powerful alien tricksters were doing it to make Richard try to believe in God. And so since you can't rule that out, Dawkins concluded that nothing could ever convince him. Now think about that. That's Richard Dawkins saying that even if God did exist, there's nothing that could even possibly convince him that God exists. God could appear right here and be blasting lightning bolts 
And you could always say, well, maybe it's powerful alien tricksters trying to trick me. So what, what happened with the new atheists is they didn't come up with some great methodology designed to get to the truth. They constructed a position that is immune to evidence that goes against their position. And there are other positions that can do that. Metaphy uh, metaphysical solipsism is a view that does that. A metaphysical solipsist is someone who believes that he's the only thing that exists. And that the world around him is just something he creates in his mind to entertain himself for all eternity. If you were to encounter a, an actual metaphysical solipsist, what evidence could you give that person to convince him that something outside of him exists? The answer is nothing. Because you'd be sitting there talking to him, he thinks you're a figment of his imagination. There's no evidence you could possibly give him. So, naturalism is, is more like an expanded version of that. A metaphysical solipsist is, I'm the only thing that exists, and a, met a metaphysical naturalist is, you know, the, the, the physical world is all that exists. And so, um, you've got our good friend uh, Richard Dawkins, who ironically has spent most of his career challenging theists to give him evidence for God, and yet, when it comes right down to it, he acknowledges there's no evidence. Can, isn't that weird? You develop a methodology that's immune to evidence, and then you go around, where's your evidence? Give me your evidence. I'm going to reject it no matter what it is, even if it's airtight, 100% certain, I'm still going to reject it, but come on, give me your evidence. I have to point out this, again, this method could be used to reject absolutely anything. If I asked you, if I, if I lit a match or a lighter right now and I asked somebody to come hold their hand in it, most of you are going to say no. And anybody that says yes, probably, you know, it's not because you don't know what's going to happen, but maybe you've got a, a streak of uh, self-mutilation or something, I don't know. But the fact is, everybody knows not to touch the flame, it'll burn you. Okay? Now, how long did it take you to learn that? One time, touching a flame usually results in a person never wanting to touch a flame again. And if you do, it's accidental, right? You were careless or something like that. Well, think about what this implies about reality. Where did you get the idea that what you saw happening right here at this particular moment was true in all other instances of this? You haven't experienced every flame in the world, have you? How do you know that the next time you touch a flame, it's going to burn you? What you're assuming, and this, this is recognized by philosophers like David Hume, who, by the way, puts to shame contemporary atheists. People like Dawkins don't have to hold a candle to David Hume. David Hume really was a brilliant man. He was an atheist, but he was made in the image of God. He was utterly brilliant. So was Bertrand Russell. And both of them said this principle that we all assume has no foundation given atheism. Because what you're doing is you're assuming that what you experience in one place is, is a type of event so that where you experience that same sort of thing elsewhere, it has the same results. We all do this. We, we learn from experience. You experience something one time or two times or three times, and you eventually generalize it. Right? One instance, two instances of touching a flame lead you to conclude, okay, fire burns. So you don't have to have universal experience to draw the conclusion from a couple of examples that uh, fire burns. But here's why David Hume and Bertrand Russell had a problem with this as atheists. They'd say, first of all, they, as atheists, they said all knowledge is based on observation. Well, how many of you have observed all instances of fire. You don't have universal observation. It all rests on this idea that nature is uniform. But wait a minute, do atheists have this belief that nature is uniform? And, and if it's uniform, maybe it's just uniform today but not tomorrow. Why do we project onto the world this continuity? It all seems to assume that we live in an orderly world. But on the principles of atheism, there's no basis for that belief. The prayers of Muslims are not a peaceful prayer. It is a savage prayer, and it should be the reason why Muslims should never have a mosque or Islamic center in America. We will attend Master session, you find out why. So we'll move on. This is my beloved wife, Vicky. She's an I. Uh, Vicky and I have been married now for 33 years, and I believe that these are the best 33 years of her life. <laughs> obviously, she's not here, so I can say whatever. All right, Israel or Palestine. 
Israel or Palestine. It's not Israel and Palestine, it is Israel or Palestine. And by the way, the problem we have here have nothing to do with the land. I explain to you why. You can actually move all the people of Gaza to one of the small designs that you see on the screen here. See the design over the Palestinian flag. By the way, you hear me say Palestinian, Palestinian, Palestinians, Palestinians, it's the same thing. Arabic, English, all right? You can move all the people from, from Gaza Strip to one of these empty areas. They have more land than they can ever have. But the problem, once again, is not about land. It's about the hatred for the Jews and the Christians, which we'll be talking about in our broadcast uh, last session. If you remove the Jewish people from Israel completely, and give it to the Muslims, you think there will be peace between the Muslims and the Jews? No, they will hunt them. As I always say, if you put the Jewish people on the moon, the Muslim will try to figure one way or another, send somebody to the moon to kill the Jewish people. How many times do we read the word Palestine in the Quran? I read the Quran and I started the Hadith and Muhammad forgot to mention the word Palestine zero times. No kidding. I mean, if, if I open the Bible, I guarantee you there are what, 800 times the word Palestine, the word Palestinians, people group, are mentioned about. As a fact, we're going to read one, maybe if not today, tomorrow. Why Muhammad did not mention anything about Palestine or Palestine? In reality, Muhammad did not have one prophecy. He, didn't, he knows nothing about the future of anything. So why is he going to talk about it? Why is mentioned in the Bible? Because there was a people who lived there and there was a promises of a prophecy written about these people, the Palestinians, and we will find out what will happen then around 500 BC. So this is not, this history, it was mentioned before it happened and as it happened and how it was ended. How about the next question, how many times uh, is Israel mentioned in the Quran? 44 times. Two times by just by the name Israel, which is by the way Jacob, and most of them do not know how the world that got name changed from Jacob to Israel unless you go back to Genesis account. But 42 times, Bani Israel, the children of Israel, it's all over the Quran. When you say that God should, do, if God existed, he should do this, you're saying that there are moral obligations that would apply to anyone. Not, not just us, they're, they're, they're universal. Because those aren't available on your atheist friend's worldview, right? Where, 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 where's your atheist friend getting ideas of moral values that would apply even to God if God existed? That means this person believes in objective moral values that apply universally even to a divine being. Well, that means you can't, you can't believe that, a, that, uh, that morality is relative or that it's just relative to culture, relative to persons, and so on. In other words, this would, this, would, uh, this, this would kind of fall into presuppositional apologetics and so on. It's built into your atheist friends a, a, an ethical system that is inconsistent with that person's view. How, do you, how can you say what an omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good being would do unless you think there is some, there is some absolute standard of right and wrong that would apply even to God? Well, it's... Super duper late now. We're just getting back from day two, and man, was that fun! We did a little uh, recording of some YouTube video with everybody in the audience, and it was just hilarious. So, uh, gotta get ready for the next morning. Gotta get up and out early, but yeah been great. We have amazing funny moments and a good old a good old skit. I hope they hope they put it out soon so I don't have to wait to see it. That'll be fun. So uh till tomorrow.